On a clear, frosty night, I and the head of the operations department still a few times walked near our dugouts. I don't understand all this, Elklep. If I'm not mistaken, along with the 8th Italian Army was put into battle and the German Weichseinheitsheitet Army Corps. Apparently, the German formations have also given up their positions. I have to assume. Probably they were dragged away by the Italians who fled without a trace. When you think about it, Elklep, we've been going from victory to victory since 1940. Now defeat follows defeat. There must be a reason for it. I consider the main reason to be slanted, inflexible tactics. We rarely and always react very sluggishly to the enemy's activities, underestimating them in the most irresponsible way. The more I think about it, the more I am depressed by the thought that we too, the command of the Sixth Army, showed in decisive moments limited and narrow-mindedness. Of course, today it is easy to judge the past. In the days leading up to November 1920, neither Paulus, nor Schmidt, nor course commanders, with the exception of Seidlitz, neither you nor I were ready, contrary to the orders of Hitler and the general command of ground forces, to break through to the southwest to avoid the threatening encirclement. And then it wasn't too late. We would have saved the lives of tens of thousands of people, and meanwhile they fell in a battle that should rather be called our agony because we did not have enough ammunition, fuel and food. And does it not follow from this that all of us who occupy command positions in the Sixth Army will be labelled as co-conspirators of what happened? You know my point of view, Adam. We're soldiers and we have a duty to obey. This remains true even when we are unable to understand the correctness of an order, and maybe we have to lay down our bones here ourselves. Every soldier, and especially every officer like you and me, must reckon with this. We'll live, we'll see. Things may still take a different, favourable turn for us. You and I have known each other long enough to know that we are not both cowards, I replied. If we come to an end here, it means that we will suffer a fate that we can expect every minute at the front. I quite agree with you that our profession obliges us to that. But first of all, we're not talking about the two of us, but about 270,000 soldiers. Secondly, I will allow myself to repeat that it is hardly possible to say, when speaking about everything that is happening to our units now, that they are fighting, or rather to say that they are dying. You know that as well as I do. Who is responsible for this slow death? Is it only Hitler and the High Command? Is it only Manstein and his staff? Are we not to blame? Did we as military commanders fulfil our soldierly duty towards the army? Didn't we fail to act at the moment when our officer's honour obliged us to act independently in the interests of our soldiers? Please, Elklep, understand me correctly. I am far from claiming to be a judge assessing the actions of the army command, and I do not want to torment myself. I myself find it difficult to answer these questions but neither can I simply dismiss them. These questions arise, they drill my brain, and the more painful, the faster our situation deteriorates. Your optimism, my dear, does you credit. And I was considered an optimist among my friends, but today's news of the defeat of the 8th Italian Army has almost completely undermined my faith. Don't get wise, Adam, it's no use. We can't yet fully assess the situation, of course the Russians have struck with large forces. Undoubtedly the southern section of the front is in jeopardy, but the ground forces' general command will cope with the situation. A few more days and we'll give Gotha's army a hand. We'll be out of the mire. We'll be back in the field. Today, our divisions in the southern section of the cauldron reported that already heard the thunder of the cannons of the army of Gotha. We stood outside my new shelter, Sparks were flying out of the small chimney. Apparently, my assistant was still hard at work on the furnace. When I left in the afternoon hours, frost glistened on the walls. Have you seen my villa yet, Elklep? I haven't had the chance yet. Come in for half an hour. I still have a bottle of cognac in my suitcase. A good sip is a good remedy for agonising thoughts and cold. The colonel followed me down the five steps to the entrance of the bunker. I opened the door. 
My Oberleutnant was squatting in front of the stove, stirring the glowing embers. Compared to the temperature outside, the room was pleasantly warm. The walls must have thawed. While Elklep was talking to my employee, I took a bottle of Martel out of a drawer and uncorked it. There was a glass for Elklep, and the two of us used government-issued aluminum mugs. We pushed our chairs closer to the stove. To the successful outcome of the battle, full outcome, Elklep raised his glass. We supported his toast. We drank the throat-burning drink in a gulp. What a pleasure it was. And if the outcome is not favourable, what then, Elklep? If we can't localise the breakthrough in the Italian section, we'll not then have to quickly pull back the army put into battle so that it does not fall into the encirclement? Because then we are doomed to disaster. What are you always shouting today? What's that about? Catastrophe means death or captivity, or rather, only death. Captivity equals death. According to the newspapers and radio programmes for soldiers, you're right. But to tell the truth, I was never convinced that the Russians really shoot everyone who is captured. When we were stationed at Rezhev last fall, a lot of leaflets signed by German POWs were dropped. I myself saw several copies with our chief of the intelligence department. He told me that the signatories were indeed members of the units named in the leaflets and were listed as missing in action. Be that as it may, Adam, I will never surrender. So, according to you, an army in the most desperate situation, with no hope of escaping from encirclement, should let the enemy destroy itself? How is your thesis different from calling for mass suicide? I, too, am afraid of captivity. But do we have the right to take responsibility for the fact that only under the influence of fear, perhaps unreasonable, hundreds of thousands of people will sacrifice themselves? It is senseless. I believe that the struggle must continue as long as there is hope of getting out of the encirclement. Otherwise, it is a question of if the last hope for it is lost. My dear Adam, I can assure you that I will never agree to the cessation of the struggle, for that would be tantamount to captivity, and captivity is death. How do you intend to avoid capture, Elklep? I will ask Paulus to allow me to go to the front as a common soldier. There I'll sell my life as dearly as possible. That's madness, Elklep. It's nothing short of suicide. Think of your wife and children. There is nothing dishonourable in a commander stopping the fight if to continue. It is to sacrifice tens of thousands of human lives needlessly. In my opinion, you would have to think it over thoroughly again. The chief of operations rose from his seat. There is nothing to think about, but I hope that everything will still end well. Then he bade farewell to me and my Oberleutnant, silently and confusedly listening to our conversation. Hitherto, I had scarcely had an opportunity to visit the troops in the front line. On December 19th, I was going to make up for lost time and see for myself how things really were there. Look, do not get to the enemy, said Paulus, when I reported to him about the trip. I put on my map the exact front line on the latest reports, Mr General. I'm going to the 44th and 76th Infantry Divisions. We left at seven o'clock. I did not know the driver. He and his passenger car were attached to our headquarters from some division. On the way through Gonchari to Rososhka, I witnessed amazing scenes played out day after day at battalion medical aid stations, evacuation stations and field infirmaries. At one of the infirmaries I got out of the car. Back in September, I had visited a divisional medical station near Gumrak. The impressions of it are deeply etched in my memory. However, what I saw now in this temporary hospital was much more terrible, one might say nightmarish. The exhausted orderlies were pulling the seriously wounded out of the cars and carrying them on stretchers to the sanitary tent. There they would lie on blood-soaked, dirty blankets until the operating room became available. The operating room was in a one-storey house about 15 metres long, with a Red Cross flag hanging over the entrance. To get in, I had to squeeze through a crowd of wounded waiting in line. One of them spoke to me. Help us, Mr Colonel. We haven't eaten anything for three days. Most of us have frostbite on our hands and feet. 
There, up ahead, all the assembly and dressing stations are full. The doctors sent us here. From a face covered with dirt and stubble, tired, feverishly glittering eyes looked at me. The soldier's arms were wrapped in strips of woolen blanket. I told him I had come to talk to the doctors. Then I squeezed my way into the building. Through the open door I could see the room for the wounded. They had already been treated and were awaiting evacuation. It was an ominous cluster of white bandages and dirty uniforms. The wounded were lying cramped on the floor and covered with overcoats or rags. In the next room was an operating room. When I appeared in the doorway, a man separated from the group surrounding the operating table and came toward me. It was a doctor. With sunken cheeks, pale, exhausted, he stood in front of me in a blood-stained gown and a smeared rubber apron. Together with three other doctors and twenty orderlies, we have been working day and night without a break for three weeks, he told me. During that time, our infirmary had to be moved twice. Once because an airplane bomb destroyed half the house, killing about thirty wounded and nine of our men, the other time because the Russian artillery hit us with two shells with equal success. Now we can no longer move from the place because we have lost all our vehicles. Every last one of our places is occupied. Of course, we give help to all the new arrivals. We give them a bowl of hot soup or a cup of tea, change their bandages and send them to the city. There, in the houses that are still standing and in the basements of the ruins, auxiliary infirmaries have been set up where these poor people will at least have a roof over their heads. What do you do with the seriously wounded, Doctor? I asked. We send them on divisional trucks to the nursery airfield. The Chief of Army Sanitation orders their departure from the cauldron, Mr. Colonel. What we're doing here hardly has anything to do with medicine. It's a disaster. If you go ahead, you'll unfortunately see that it's even worse than ours. And so it was. There were cars full of seriously wounded people in the way of the columns. They didn't move any more. They were frozen. The tanks were out of fuel. By the time the driver, usually the only person able to walk, after hours of searching and begging for fuel, returned with his canister, it was all over. The fierce frost extinguished the life that barely flowed in the weakened bodies. No one cared for this pile of dead. Gradually it was mercifully enveloped in a white shroud of snow. Wherever there were houses, tents or shelters, the lightly wounded and the sick gathered. In small groups they dragged themselves with difficulty on foot to the city. Seldom were they lucky enough to catch a hitchhiker. The city, which during the heavy summer and fall fighting had been avoided by anyone who was not sent to it by order, had now become a magnet. Everyone hoped to find shelter in one of the cellars, to receive medical help from some sanitary unit or even a bowl of soup. This is roughly what Napoleon's defeated army looked like 130 years ago, when it was retreating westward. Wrapped in blankets and cloak tents, with sackcloth and pants instead of boots on their frost-bitten feet, barely moving their legs, the soldiers of the Sixth Army, marked with the seal of death, apathetically wandered eastward. There was almost nothing soldierly left in them. It was a fallen spirit unarmed crowd. To save it, medical aid, food and warm shelters were needed immediately. Every day of delay meant that the fate of many was irrevocably sealed. The adjutant of the 76th Infantry Division supplemented my own observations with a detailed report of the personnel situation. The attrition, especially of sick and completely exhausted men, had already become disastrous a few days ago. The shortage of men in the infantry is increasing. Reports of sickness are usually received so late that it is impossible to help. How do we explain this? Because up until now it was just the opposite. Many soldiers have reported sick at the slightest indisposition in order to get out of the battle zone for a few days, I said. That's true, Mr. Colonel, but that's not the case now. Many avoid reporting sick because they are afraid of being abandoned in retreat. I believe that most of the frontline infantrymen are sick. What is the mood of the troops? It's hard to say, Mr. Colonel. After the ring of encirclement closed, the mood was depressed. But when it became known that Goth had launched an offensive to rescue us, everyone became cheerful and hopeful again. 
we thought the ring around us would be broken quickly. Eight days have passed since then, and it is clear that everyone is greatly disappointed. There are individual voices sharply criticising the High Command, cursing Hitler, the Nazi Party, and the war in general. Even some officers do not understand the meaning of this worth so much sacrifice order to hold out to the end and the slow death of our army. However, so far, the 76th Infantry Division has shown resilience in any situation. I interrupted the divisional adjutant. It turns out that the phenomena you described contradict the behaviour of soldiers in battle. That's right, Mr. Colonel. If the enemy attacks, even those who just a few minutes ago were cursing Hitler grab their weapons. They fight, first, because they are panic-stricken with fear of capture, secondly, because everyone is waiting for Goth to break the ring of encirclement. How close did Colonel General Goth manage to get? As I learned before I left for you, the army that is deblocking reflects the strong attacks of the enemy. It's making extremely slow progress. But we hope that in a few days things will improve. On the way to the 44th Infantry Division, I again witnessed horrible scenes. Soon my car was filled with wounded men. One had his entire head bandaged, with only his mouth and eyes visible between the blood-soaked bandages. Another had a shot arm in a bandage. The third I picked up because he was walking along the roadbed, swaying from side to side, and every minute you could expect him to fall and never get up again. Shaking with fever, he was now sitting between two other wounded men in the back seat of my all-terrain vehicle. Where should I drop you off? I asked the wounded man in the arm. If possible. He looked at my insignia. Mr. Colonel, at an infirmary where we could be received. Let's try Gumrack. There's a real infirmary there. Let's see if we can't get two more. My driver gave me a reproachful look as I picked up two more head-wounded men who were sitting in the snow on the side of the road, waiting for help. They nestled into the back of the back seat. It was quite late. I gave up on visiting the 44th Infantry Division, especially since I had enough impressions already, and told them to turn east. Slowly, past the Army Command Post, we reached Gumrak. Although this infirmary was also overcrowded, I managed to fit five of my companions in it. I arrived at the command post later than expected and reported to Paulus on my return. The order to break out of the encirclement was still not there. The General Command of Army Group Don, said the Army Commander, remains silent. The only answer received to my inquiry says, to wait and start the operation Thunderstroke only by direct order. How long will this take, Mr. General? As the adjutant of the 76th Infantry Division reported to me today, the shortage of personnel in the infantry is already so great that it is not possible to create a continuous front of defence. LI Army Corps was ordered to withdraw companies from the urban section of the front and transfer them to divisions defending the western and southern sections, said Paulus. Look at El Klepper defence plan. In addition, we decided to form from soldiers, non-commissioned officers and officers of headquarters, rear services, tank regiments and artillery divisions combined units. We will call them fortress battalions, since some infantry regiments disbanded third battalions. Commanders with combat experience are enough. Make a proposal for filling officer positions. Has the person in charge of forming these fortress battalions been appointed yet, Mr. General? Not yet, Adam. Who would you suggest? I think Colonel Lutman, commander of the 14th Armoured Division. He has a capable staff and the division is made up of only scattered small combat teams. I agree. Lutman is the right man for the job. Schmidt appreciates him too. He won't object to your proposal. Indeed, Schmidt immediately agreed, when I then reported to him my proposal. Yes, Latman is the right man for the combined units, said Schmidt. Will he be satisfied with himself, Herr General? As far as I know the mood of the troops, neither the officers nor the soldiers have no great desire to play the role of frontline fire department in such hastily assembled units. If this was a simple case, we wouldn't need Lutman. He can handle it, the Chief of Staff said succinctly. 
I felt uneasy. Fortress battalions? Actually nonsense if you remember that many of these soldiers had no combat experience as infantrymen. Most of them had lived until now without knowing hardships in some shelters by the stove. Now they were suddenly being driven out into the icy cold, into a raging blizzard. Would they be able to fight? In my dugout, I busied myself with the mail delivered by the liaison officer. Its content was the usual. Extraordinary production for bravery in battles against the enemy, awards knights' crosses and German crosses in gold. The Land Forces Personnel Department reported the dispatch of orders. Iron crosses of the I and II degree, as well as the appropriate number of badges for participation in battles, knights' crosses and German crosses. In addition, there were two boxes of Croatian medals en route. Almost unbelievable. Two crates of medals, when we had in the cauldron a single Croatian artillery regiment subordinate to the 100th Jäger Division. This regiment was once supplied with the same medals in such quantity that there was no further need for them. The very next day a liaison plane arrived. It took four soldiers to drag the huge crates into my dugout. The crates took up so much space that I could hardly turn around. Oberfeldfabel Cooper opened them with an axe. They were filled to the top with Croatian war medals. It would be best, Herr Colonel, if we send the boxes to the 100th Jäger Division, Cooper said. It's pointless. They will not know what to do with them. I will talk to General Paulus. At dinner, I told about the fallen to the share of the army gift. My story caused not only general laughter, but also indignation that the precious space in the airplane was not used for food. I can cite examples in this regard which make your hair stand on end, said Oberquartiermeister von Kunowski. The last planes delivered a dozen boxes of condoms, five tons of candy, four tons of marjoram and pepper, 200,000 brochures of the propaganda department of the Wehrmacht. I wish the bureaucrats responsible for this had spent eight days in a cauldron. Then they wouldn't repeat such idiocy. I am also surprised that Colonel Bader did not prevent it, although we sent him there for that very purpose. I immediately protested vigorously to Army Group Don and asked for better instruction and control of the responsible persons at the airfields in the future. Well, Kunowski, intervened in the conversation Paulus, I too will ask Manstein to make sure that in the future such outrages will not be repeated. It seems to me that Bader has lost all influence on our supply. We should think of sending to the base airfields more suitable officers who know our situation from their own experience. I ask you, Schmidt and Kunowski, to think about this and submit suggestions to me. Several days passed, but the expected order from Manstein to begin the Operation Thunderstrike was still not. Paulus and Schmidt spoke daily with the headquarters of Army Group Don by radio on microwaves. As in earlier days, I listened to and stenographed most of the negotiations that Paulus led. Manstein, as before, avoided answering questions concerning the situation outside the cauldron. Paulus every time angry. December 20 seconds, communication with the outside world interrupted. Apparently, our troops, defending on the lower reaches of the cheer, withdrew to the south or west. So day after day passed in useless talk and inactivity. The command of the 6th Army was waiting for saving orders from above, and at the same time died in battles, froze, died of hunger, new and new thousands of soldiers, more and more weakened the vitality of those who still managed to stay alive. Paulus and his staff, the main reason of the growing, catastrophe saw in stubbornness and bad faith of Hitler, and higher command authorities. Undoubtedly, a significant part of the blame fell on them, but was not the army command itself, which obediently decided to hold out to the end, a well-functioning lever of the whole command mechanism designed to destroy people? Did it not thereby become an accomplice in the crime? At that time such a question, and even less the idea of complicity, did not even occur to us. We were a product of Prussian soldier education, accustomed to obey, to obey the order given, even if it turned out to be senseless, criminal, barbaric in relation to our troops. The main thing is that the ability of critical political thinking was not cultivated in us. 
At that time, we saw the Stalingrad catastrophe mainly as a consequence of certain military mistakes of the High Command. It did not occur to us that the Second World War, initiated by Hitler's Germany as a whole, was a crime not only against the nations we attacked, but also against the German nation. It was a sad Christmas. On December 24th, at about 6pm, the word came over the radio that Goth had been forced to begin a withdrawal. We were struck like a blow. When somewhat later we gathered at Paulus's house for dinner, he briefly mentioned the failure of Goth's deblocking offensive and the collapse of the entire southern section of the front. He spoke of the grave threat posed to Group A in the Caucasus and of the seriousness of our own situation. In spite of everything, we must not lose hope. Having said a little about the meaning of the Christmas holiday, Paulus finished with the following words. Here we are gathered around the table today to remember our families who are mentally together with us at this hour. The sharp contradiction between the terrible reality of war and the peaceful Christmas holiday could not be removed by words. Everyone felt it that evening. Therefore, the holiday was very sad. There was an almost grave silence in the bunker. The few candles burning on the table were to replace the Christmas tree decorated with glass balls and tinsel. Near each plate were two cigarettes and two or three chocolates, which General Paulus took from a large box sent to him from Romania. The mail from Germany had not arrived. Neither parcels nor letters were distributed. A heavy snowstorm almost completely interrupted air communication. I imagined my wife and daughter taking a lovingly rapid Christmas message addressed to me to the post office in 14 days or even three weeks. It never reached me. I wrote nothing to my family about our hopeless situation. I knew how much my wife was still suffering after the death of our son Heinz. In spite of this, they certainly had a premonition that disaster was coming between the Volga and the Don. Contrary to custom, that evening we parted soon after dinner. Each wanted to be alone with his thoughts or to sit a little longer with his closest associates. My subordinates were waiting for me in the room that served as the office. The fire crackling cheerfully in the stove created some cosiness. I had prepared a small gift for each of them. A few cigarettes or a cigar, a couple of galettes or cookies wrapped in newsprint. The adjutant of the army group, Colonel von Werder, sent me two bottles of brandy, which I placed on the table. The best present was a small Christmas tree, which one of the non-commissioned officers extracted from a parcel received three days ago from his wife. Oberfeld Fabel Cooper had donated a few candles from his carefully kept stock. Everyone looked at me expectantly. What was I to say to these four frontline soldiers who had been with me for over a year and had been soldiers long enough not to be deceived? All of them were married, all of them had families. I told them, without hiding anything, about the situation outside the cauldron. Then we talked about our households. Four had received mail in the last eight days, letters and pictures went around. Over the talk we managed to forget the ghastly reality. The candles burned out, the bottles were drunk to the bottom. Around midnight I went to my workroom, which also served as my bedroom. My driver had just put a few more chips into the crackling fire. I took off my boots and tunic, put out the light and lay down on the camp bed. My thoughts kept me awake. Finally I fell asleep. When I came to the office the next morning, the first day of Christmas, my staff was drinking dark junk food, which was a substitute for coffee, and nibbling on the galettes and cookies I had given them the day before. They congratulated me on the holiday. The first to shake my hand was Oberfeldfebel Küpper. Pale with sunken cheeks, he looked even skinnier and taller than usual. His hope of seeing his wife again had all but vanished overnight. The other three looked little better. I didn't even try to encourage them. I'd have to lie to do that. I decided to give them more work to do so they wouldn't have too much time to think, so I told Cooper, when you've had your breakfast, come and see me. Forgetting myself in my work seemed to me the only way out. The adjutant did not have too much work now, but it could be made up. 
Cooper, prepare data on how many soldiers, non-commissioned officers and officers of the 6th Army were out of the army at the time of the abolition of furloughs on November 19th. That is, how many could not return to their units at the end of the vacation. Further, how many furloughed officers had to return daily. I'll prepare the material now, Mr. Colonel. The data on how many furloughed men were sent out daily, we can take from our daily army orders. Only the IV Army Corps will have to be asked. Take your time and provide accurate data, I replied. At that time the phone rang. I was called Schmidt. You are familiar with the situation, Adam, said the General. We have to reckon with the fact that in the coming days, enemy attacks in the western and eastern parts of the cauldron will intensify. Severely reduced combat troops will force us to reduce the territory of the cauldron. At present, there are no intermediate positions for units that will have to withdraw. To urgently equip them, we need to call here the head of engineering service, Colonel Zell. Send a radiogram to Army Group at once, asking him to fly here. That won't be possible right away, Mr. General. I reminded him that Zell is in command of the battle group on Chira. He must be summoned immediately anyway. There are enough officers on Chira to replace Zell. Why call Zell to almost certain death? Any commander of a sapper battalion could have reconnoitred the new positions. And who would dig in the ground frozen like a stone? That's what occurred to me. On the other hand, I was glad to see an old friend again. I knew Schmidt well enough to know that it was useless to try to dissuade him from his decision. I had to go to the chief of communications and transmit a radiogram. Then I went to Paulus. Oberleutnant Zimmermann led me to the dugout commander. Paulus was preparing to make a report to the army group Don. When I entered, the general was at a desk. Paulus cordially responded to my Christmas greeting and invited me to sit down. Silence ensued. What would happen next after the chances of breaking through the encirclement diminished? This question kept us in suspense. I am not Reichenau. Holding on to the end, the Sixth Army fulfills on the vulgar historical task. Paulus quoted the first phrase of Hitler's order and added, My hands are tied in every respect. I understand you, Mr. General, but what should be the meaning of the order to hold on now? We will not be able to break out of here. Can we take responsibility for the death of an entire army? You know the orders, Adam. If we don't hold out, the southern flank of the Eastern Front will collapse. I'll be responsible if Army Group A suffers the same fate as us. It's been six weeks since these orders were issued, I remarked. In my opinion, they are already out of date. It is not quite so, answered Paulus. Manstein reported that Army Group A, as before, holds its position in the Caucasus. This is incomprehensible. The General Command of Land Forces had six weeks to withdraw from there, to reduce the front line. This would have freed up armoured divisions to support the offensive of Gotha's group. There's no point in talking about it. It's too late now. With our shattered, exhausted army, we couldn't get out of here if we wanted to. The main front line is hundreds of kilometres away from us, and the front will probably have to be pushed back even further. Suppose that together with all the commanders of corps, divisions and Schmidt at the end of November, I would order at my own risk and fear to carry out a breakthrough. Then Hitler, through his liaison officer, Major von Zitzewitz, who has his own radio station, would immediately learn of our intention and would order appropriate countermeasures. Thinking, Paulus, for a few seconds, staring intently at the planked wall of the dugout, then he looked at me again and realised that he had failed to dispel my doubts. I haven't convinced you, Adam. I can guess what you're thinking. You're comparing my actions to Reichenau's last year, when he stopped the Donetsk offensive against Hitler's orders. I nodded and Paulus continued. It is possible that the daredevil Reichenau would have fought his way westward with the Sixth Army after November 19th and then declared to Hitler, now you can judge me. But you know, Adam, I'm not Reichenau. Paulus really figured out my thoughts. He spoke the truth when he characterised himself as a general accustomed to obey, accurately weighing his actions, too cautious, indecisive man. 
But this self-assessment did not help to break the fatal vicious circle in which all of us together were hopelessly stuck in those bitter days. Reichenau or Paulus, both options meant the continuation of the war. A timely, successful breakthrough of the Sixth Army might have delayed the final defeat of Hitler's Germany, but would not have prevented it. In fact, it would not have saved the Sixth Army, as tens of thousands of survivors on the Volga River would have been exterminated in subsequent battles. At the end of December 1942, we were all still far from such an understanding of events. Whether badly, well, we continued to act like the wheels of a badly mangled German war machine. When I returned to my dugout, Cooper submitted the material compiled at my direction. At the beginning of the Red Army counter-offensive, 25,000 men were on leave. Every day about 1,000 people returned to the front. Where are these vacationers going, Mr. Colonel? If they were here, we'd be able to plug the gap. Assuming they don't turn into dead men in the cauldron. As a matter of fact, General Pfeiffer should have rounded them up outside the cauldron and kept them at the disposal of the army. Instead, by order of the army group command, all the returnees are shoved into battle groups. Amazingly, Every day a few vacationers still arrive at the boiler by transport planes. I telephoned some divisions today to get accurate numerical material for the data you requested, Cooper said. One clerk told me that when a train with vacationers arrives at the front, a loudspeaker announces that all soldiers and officers should report to the station commandant. Despite this, some do not comply and go to the airfield. The airplane commanders take them as air gunners. If these unsuspecting people knew what was going on here, they'd probably stay there. I quite understand them, Cooper. They're driven by a sense of camaraderie. It keeps a lot of people coming back to their units. I had a visit from Colonel Elklep on Christmas Day. What news? he asked after we shook hands. Did Schmidt tell you about his yesterday's telegraph conversation with General Schultz of the Army Group? I don't know anything. Was there anything interesting? There seems to be nothing new on the Chira front. However, Schultz said that the 6th Panzer Division has been recalled from Gotha's army for the defence of Morozovsk. Commanders of transport planes report that the left flank of Army Group Don has withdrawn to the west. So far, it has not been possible to completely stop the Russian offensive. It seems to me that the army group, as before, leaves us in the dark about the general situation. In any case, this confirms that we are in a hopeless situation. The 6th Panzer Division was Gotha's main striking force. If with it could not defeat the enemy, without it will not succeed even more. It is clear that Gotha will have to pull back and the remaining two of his weakened tank divisions. Absolutely, agreed Elklep. Manstein, even on the 16th at the latest December 18th, realised that a new catastrophe is looming. It is unclear why he did not authorise the Operation Thunderstrike. An order for a breakthrough would have doubled the strength of our soldiers. Now that time has been wasted, the Army Group reports that we should be ready for a breakthrough. Fuel and food for this will be delivered by air, but only if the weather is favourable. This is pure mockery. Elklep. What, in fact, think Manstein and his staff about the situation of the Sixth Army? It has nothing to do with military necessity anymore. I completely agree with you. Paulus is just compiling a new report on the dire state of our divisions. The next day this report was sent to the headquarters of Army Group Don. It said approximately the following. Heavy losses, frost and inadequate supply have recently greatly reduced the combat effectiveness of divisions. Therefore, the army, as it has done so far, manages to repel minor enemy attacks and hold out for some time. The prerequisites for this are improved supplies and the arrival of replenishment. If the Russians withdraw large forces from the Gotha front and with these or other troops take the offensive against the fortress, we will not be able to resist for a long time. Breakthrough from the encirclement is no longer feasible unless a corridor is formed for the withdrawal of troops and the army replenished with men and provisions. 
Therefore, I ask to inform the High Command of the need to take vigorous measures to quickly unblock the army, if the overall situation does not force to sacrifice it. It goes without saying that the army will do everything to hold on to the last opportunity. In addition, Paulus reported on the radio. Today, delivered by air only 70 tonnes. Bread runs out tomorrow, fats, tonight, food for dinner, in some core, tomorrow. Urgently needed drastic measures. So, the 6th Army commander has sent a new report. Actually, which one is it? However, it should be said that by December 25th, when the strong 6th Panzer Division was recalled by Manstein from the site of Gotha, Paulus could hardly on his own responsibility to give an order to break through the encirclement. For this purpose, the 6th Army was already too weakened to break through the steel ring of a strong, smartly and persistently fighting the enemy, and come into contact with the other armies of the Don Group without significant help from outside. It lacked heavy weapons, tanks, ammunition, fuel. I think Paulus cannot be reproached for not making a decision at his own risk at that time. However, how often he and all of us obediently reported, obeyed, kept silent, when there was still an opportunity to put the higher command authorities before the fait accompli, and, having realised the breakthrough, to save the lives of tens of thousands of soldiers who soon died of hunger, frost, or were killed. The joint responsibility for the death of the Sixth Army, arising from this fact, cannot be absolved from those who then occupied high command positions in the encircled formations. The enumeration of motives and considerations that guided them can explain but not justify their actions. We remained prisoners of the order obedience scheme, even when the order clearly violated the traditional Prussian-German idea of soldierly duty and was immoral. We were even more untenable in choosing the true alternative to the sacrifice of the Sixth Army at the behest of German imperialism, the alternative which was timely surrender. We were completely ignorant of the political side of events and therefore were unable to make such a choice. In the following days, by order of Paulus, all preparations for a breakthrough from the cauldron were cancelled. Trucks were sent to the units. Captain Tupke again returned to the duties of the Oberquartermeister, but he was soon assigned to the bases of transport planes outside the boiler. At the end of December, Colonel Zell arrived at the boiler. Confusedly, we shook hands. I then escorted him to the commander's dugout. After listening to the report on the arrival, Paulus ordered to tell how things are outside the boiler. Worse than any fears, Mr General. Before the flight, I managed in the headquarters of the army group, at my friend Colonel Busey, to look at the operational map. Tatsinskaya, with the main supply depots, was surrendered on December 24th. The airfield was taken by the Red Tanks from the start. Almost all the airplanes have fallen prey to the Russians. This will severely affect the supply of the boiler by air. Morozovsk is also under threat. To the west of the site of the 3rd Romanian Army are fighting. Milarovo was already occupied by the enemy, but now we must have retaken it. To stop the enemy, hastily let down battle groups and individual battalions. By order of Manstein, the 6th Panzer Division is taken away from Gotha. For this reason, as well as in view of the threat of encirclement, Goth had to retreat. Army Group A is still in the Caucasus. The headquarters of Army Group Don from Novocherkask was transferred to Taganrog. In other words, Zell, we must finally bury the hope of liberation from the encirclement. One thing remains, to fight on, to tie up as many enemy forces as possible and make it easier for Manstein to create a new front. Schmidt was present at Zell's message. It made much less impression on him than on Paulus. Chief of Staff responded with an empty rejoinder. The battle will continue, my dear. The commander and his chief of staff decided to lead the 6th Army to perdition. How long will our hardship-stricken, doomed troops be able to hold off the onslaught of superior enemy forces? Is the death of more than 200,000 soldiers justified for the sake of a dubious goal? The command of Army Group Don announced by radio the appointment of Colonel Van Hoven as the new Chief of Army Communications. His predecessor, Colonel Arnold, was out of action after seven wounds. On December 28, 1942, 
I saw my new workmate for the first time. Tall and slender, with an intelligent, narrow face, he was perfectly oriented in the situation inside and outside the boiler. Tell me, Hooven, I asked him, where did you get the data to navigate so well? I was the commander of the communications regiment of the RGK. Naturally, I had ample opportunity to familiarise myself with the course of events on all fronts. In addition, on December 24th, General Felgebel, in the Führer's headquarters, personally introduced me to my new duties. On December 26, I flew to Army Group Don in Novocherkask. There I supplemented my information with new data. In subsequent conversations with Generals Paulus and Schmidt van Hooven fully confirmed the assessment of the situation outlined to us by Zeller. Hooven outlined the situation even more correctly because his information was based on reports and orders that had passed through his hands in Hitler's headquarters. It turned out that the ground forces high command believed in the success of the action Gotha even as late as December 24th. General Felgebel, Chief of Army Communications, asked Hooven to send his regards to Polis and tell him that he hoped to see him in person soon. Hooven at first also believed in the imminent release of the 6th Army from the cauldron. However, his stay in Army Group Don quickly dispelled this illusion. In a conversation with Paulus, he expressed the opinion that the immediate general breakthrough from the encirclement is the only opportunity to save at least part of the 6th Army, as the forces for its release from the outside no longer exist. When I appeared for a report in the afternoon, Paulus once again confirmed to me his point of view, already reported by him on December 26th to Army Group Don. Hooven's proposal to break through the encirclement ring is not feasible. I do not deny that he is well-oriented in many respects, but the latest intentions of the General Command of Ground Forces and Army Group Don is not known to him either. Schmidt was angry with Van Hoven. He reproached him with a pessimistic assessment of the situation which paralyses the will to fight and prevents to hold on to the end. Indeed, in the headquarters argued a lot about the statements of the new Chief of Communications of the Army. In these days began to form two groups, while one part of the officers believed that there was no more salvation for the encircled army, others continued to believe in its liberation. General Hubei flies to Hitler. If the Führer had known, some said, what was really going on here, he would undoubtedly have taken decisive action. It is likely that he has not even seen our reports. This view was held mainly by young officers from the department El Klepper. Under his influence, Paulus and Schmidt even considered whether to send someone to report to Hitler personally. At this time, I received from the personnel department of the Army radiogram of the following content. To send General of Panzer Forces Huber in the Führer's headquarters to present him with swords to the Knight's Cross with oak leaves. Now this is a convenient occasion, said Paulus after reading the radiogram. Huber must inform Hitler unvarnished about our situation. He will listen to this decorated general. Schmidt, order that urgently were prepared all the necessary materials on food, ammunition, fuel, tanks, guns, and most importantly, on the number of combat-ready troops and combat-ready troops, losses from fire, frostbite and disease, as well as the wounded and difficulties with their medical care. The Information Service, was still functioning relatively well in the 6th Army's war machinery. When Hubi arrived at Army headquarters, a curator data was already ready. In addition, Paulus and Schmidt gave Hubi verbal instructions and asked the general of the Panzer forces to tell and personal experiences to finally achieve a realistic assessment of Hitler our situation. On the same day, Huber left on a communications plane. Curious whether Hubei will be able to tell everything there, or Hitler, as usual, will interrupt him after the first phrases to avoid unpleasant messages, said Paulus. In these days, I had a lot of officers hanging around doing nothing, because their units were defeated. Some of them are scared for a new assignment, most of them are scared for permission to fly away. Every day one of them could take a seat in an airplane of Army Group Don as a liaison officer. I was instructed to select candidates on the basis of medical reports. 
Usually these were elderly people who the doctor considered not quite fit for combat service. Every such case was checked and decided by General Schmidt personally. Only those who, being in the cauldron himself, saw how inexorable death mowed down his comrades, can imagine what feelings enveloped these liaison officers when they received the order to leave. I escaped death, said one of those who came to me with a report of their impending departure. However, some of them still died before the end of the war. One day that Leipzig battle painter who had come to see us in the summer came to see me. Under his arm he carried drawings, sketches for battle paintings. His face bore the marks of hardship and suffering. I showed the drawings to Schmidt and suggested that the artist be allowed to fly away. For us, he was just unnecessary ballast because he was not fit to be a soldier. But Schmidt was not moved by this. He refused to make an exception. General Paulus, whom I then asked for a positive solution to the question, did not dare to correct his chief of staff. Thus the artist became a senseless victim of the very monster of war to which he had devoted his abilities. He left my dugout in a completely depressed state. Cooper appeared at the door. Mail from Corps' headquarters, Mr. Colonel, he reported. Give it here. Oberfeldfeebel pointed to a paper lying on top. It was a detailed report of the Paitid Army Corps on the increasing phenomena of decay in the troops. After the failure of the deblocking offensive became known, the will to resist greatly weakened, reported the Corps headquarters. Attached to the document were reports on violations of discipline, abandonment of positions, withdrawal to Stalingrad, disobedience of orders and self-shooting. Even the officers began to disband. I immediately familiarised Paulus and Schmidt with this document. Now we have to reckon with such tendencies. Commanders must act decisively and restore order. So reacted always straightforward Schmidt to the signs of decay. Geitz followed Schmidt's demand. I learned about his order on VTII Army Corps from the head of our operational department. I still remember that each paragraph began with the words, to be shot followed by a list of offences. Who will leave positions without orders? Who will not fulfil orders? Who will establish communication with the enemy? And so on. Paulus was more reasonable. We should not forget what these soldiers had endured in recent weeks. If they could eat and sleep again, they would look at everything with different eyes, said the commander. Of course, Mr General, that plays a role too, I said. But I think there is more to it than that. In my conversations with young soldiers and officers, I always encounter the following phenomenon. The soldiers are deeply disappointed. They no longer believe that they are fighting for a just cause. At school, at home, in the Hitler Youth, in the NSDAP and the Wehrmacht, they were instilled with a sense of the greatness of fighting for a noble cause. They believed in the Führer, trusted him, sacrificed their lives. Now they have learned that they have been deceived, that their trust is answered with lies. This is an extremely painful process, in many cases inevitably leading to a weakening of discipline. If you are referring to young people, this is true to some extent. However, there are symptoms of decay among older people as well. The document tells us something else. It is stated that every night from the enemy's location, the Germans, through a powerful talking machine, call on our soldiers to stop resistance as it is useless. Hitler allegedly betrayed the Sixth Army. He sacrificed it for the sake of his prestige. I reported to Paulus. This is the work of German communists who emigrated to Russia, said the commander. From the dropped leaflets we know the names of Ulbricht, a former deputy of the Reichstag from the CGTG, and the writers Weinert and Brodel, also communists. So far I do not attach too much importance to this propaganda. Of course, we must be vigilant lest radical sentiments manifest themselves. For the time being, it is enough if we point out that this is enemy propaganda whose aim is to break our steadfastness. Otherwise we should continue to maintain the hope of liberation from encirclement. Support the hope of liberation that the commander himself doesn't believe in. Isn't that what Hitler and the general staff did? 
lying in return for trust? Can an army commander go this way? When death and suffering are all around, does this have anything in common with soldier duty and obedience? These questions arose not only for me, but also for Paulus. However, they did not lead to any real consequences. What prevailed was the desire to hold out to the end. This is the complicity in the crime of General Paulus and the entire military top brass of the Sixth Army. Complicity in the crime from the point of view of historical, military and simply human. Promotions and Honours The Wehrmacht High Command rewarded Paulus in its own way for his decision to hold firm. At the end of December came a radiogram of the personnel department of the land forces. It gave the army commander special rights, which until now enjoyed only this department, to promote officers and generals in the rank of lieutenant general, to award the German cross in gold and the knight's cross. Hitler wanted to ease our demise. Simplified conditions for the awarding of the highest military orders and the extraordinary awarding of ranks should have contributed to his planned apotheosis of the Sixth Army. Along with this, there was another aspect that seemed important to me at the time. Increased military ranks meant increased pensions for widows and orphans. Through the Army Corps, divisions were made aware of the increased chances for this honourable entitlement. In the time that followed, the work in my department again went into full swing. On December 31st, Captain Tupke flew to Army Group Don, whose command post had meanwhile moved from Novocherkask to Taganrog, about 200 kilometres to the west. The day before, in the presence of Schmidt, Paulus personally explained to him his tasks as the Army Commissioner for Supply. You must introduce yourself to Field Marshal von Manstein personally, and tell him that I have obliged you to take care of the expedient loading and full use of transport aircraft. You know what's going on here. Take with you all materials regarding food, ammunition, fuel, medicine, and present them to Field Marshal. Schmidt added, See to it that all available vehicles are finally used for us. Army Group must stop sending dozens of Heinkel 111 on the Tatsinskaya left by us. Our soldiers are in danger of starving to death. Let us know when we can expect an improvement in supply. Manstein made the captain first quartermaster for the supply of the 6th Army by air. Töpke energetically tried to help the encircled army. However, there was no noticeable improvement in supply. The total payload capacity of the airplanes was too small. Soviet anti-aircraft artillery and winter weather drastically reduced the amount of supplies delivered by air. After the loss of Morozovsk and Tatsinskaya, the distances from the original airfields to the boiler increased considerably. The airfields at Shakti, Novocherkask, Voroshilovgrad and Salsk were 350 to 400 kilometres in a straight line from the nursery. It was even 450-500 kilometres to Stalino and Taganrog. In a radiogram on the occasion of the new year, Hitler again assured that every member of the Sixth Army could enter the new year with a firm confidence that the Führer would not abandon to the fate of the heroic fighters on the Volga, and Germany would have the means to free them from the encirclement. At the same time, General of Panzer Forces Paulus was promoted to Colonel General. Loyalty for loyalty. Then this radiogram Hitler, despite all our anguish, still had a known impact, although it was treated with more doubt than the same message six weeks earlier. As a result of repeated disappointments, inhuman deprivation and uncomplaining death, something in us had broken. However, we were far from understanding the essence of what was happening, and it was difficult to penetrate into it. Events were inexorably approaching their fateful finish, and nothing could prevent it. It was January 1943, the first morning of the new year. When I woke up, the fire was already blazing in our stove. I slipped my feet into my boots, put on my tunic, and went out to the chancellery. My subordinates did not look like a year ago in Poltava. They sat depressed, indifferent, indifferent. Silently they gave me their hands. I could not cheer them up either, as I myself was experiencing internal discord. 
The heads of departments gathered at Schmidt to go to Paulus and congratulate him on the new year and the production of Colonel General. I knew he had been waiting for this promotion. Now that it had come, it caused only a tortured smile. We had already left Paulus's dugout when I remembered that I had forgotten to pin the third star on the commander's epaulets. I returned to correct the omission. To my apology, he said, Leave it, Adam. With this promotion, Hitler only wants to ease my end. The usually taciturn general began to talk about his trips to the divisions. You can be glad you don't have to go to the front lines every day. When you returned from the 76th Infantry Division a few days ago, I realised what an impression everything you saw had made on you. Since then, the situation has deteriorated even more. The stamp of starvation is visible everywhere. At the dressing stations, the doctors assured me that hunger and frost were causing more casualties than enemy action. Infirmaries and divisional medical stations are crammed with thousands of wounded, half-frozen and exhausted, lacking the most basic necessities to help them. The will to live is lost. A sense of hopelessness is spreading more and more. But outside the cauldron only beautiful words are found to assess the situation. Still, I think, Colonel General, that after Hubei's report to Hitler, something will change. As far as I know, Hubei will speak frankly. Let's hope he does. I'm afraid it's too late for that now. In any case, I'm still bound by Hitler's order to hold out to the last bullet. Have you heard, Colonel General, the wild rumours going around the cauldron? On the western section of our front, soldiers are talking about SS divisions that have allegedly reached Kalach, as if artillery cannonade is even heard. Others talk about a parachute division that landed between Kalach and Karpovka. I know about these rumours and would like to know who is making up such nonsense. One regimental commander believes that the birthplace of this nonsense is the Potomnik airfield. Maybe he's right. It is possible that pilots of transport vehicles inadvertently, or even on instructions from above, invent such tales to distract us from agony. Don't you think you can do something about this avalanche of rumours, Colonel General? Shouldn't we finally tell the soldiers the truth? Of course we should. But I want to wait for Hubei's return. One of the first days of January I received a call from the Commandant of the airfield, informing me that two large transport vehicles with soldiers had arrived and asking where to send them. What a thing, I thought in surprise. What good are a handful of soldiers to us in mortal danger? Is this not the reaction of Army Group Don to the report of the Army Commander of December 26? After all, we need not 40 or 100 soldiers, but fully manned divisions. And first of all, we need food, ammunition, tanks, fuel. Please wait 15 to 20 minutes, I answered. We will check which division needs replenishment the most. The day before the order was given to disband the 79th Infantry Division, the soldiers and officers remaining from it were distributed almost exclusively to divisions fighting in the city. The headquarters of the division was taken out by airplane. In the last days, the 44th Infantry Division suffered the greatest losses. Having received the consent of General Schmidt, I informed the chief of the rear of the division and instructed him to take the newly arrived. Paulus called these actions Manstein empty gesture. He suggested that the command of Army Group Don sent to the boiler not soldiers and officers, and more food. After all, each extra soldier reduced the already tiny portion of bread. After that, Manstein forbade further sending of resupply by airplanes. Before releasing me, Paulus showed me a letter received from Manstein. Army Group Commander, referring to the repeated demands of Paulus to allow the 6th Army to break out of the encirclement, stated that he sympathised with them. However, the higher authorities can more correctly assess the situation. Therefore, Paulus should follow the orders received. In this way, on the other hand, he is relieved of responsibility for what is happening. Does this not prove, Mr Colonel General, that Manstein, from whom we expected so much, completely obeyed the dictates of Hitler? I asked. Such an impression is my impression, Adam, replied Paulus. 
This was to be expected a long time ago. Being outside the cauldron, I do not conceal that in this respect I am sceptical. But firstly, I do not know what air transport reserves the High Command has. Secondly, I am not responsible for the fulfilment of these promises. Thirdly, orders from higher authorities deprive me of freedom of action. That is why I have requested the decisions of the General Command of the Land Forces regarding the Red Army's surrender proposal. I expect to receive an answer soon. Oberleutnant Zimmermann reported that the Corps commanders gathered in the next room. I left for my dugout. Later, the Chief of Army Engineering Service, Colonel Zell, who participated in the meeting, told me how it took place. All Corps commanders already knew the text of the surrender proposal. Paulus familiarised them also with the message of Huber and asked them to express their thoughts. All unanimously spoke out against surrender and assured that the same opinion of division commanders. Meanwhile, the response of the General Command of Land Forces arrived. It read, Surrender is ruled out. Every extra day that the army holds on helps the entire front and pulls away from him Russian divisions. Paulus was again denied the freedom of action he had asked for. Army Group Don shared the viewpoint of the General Command. Major General Schmidt drew conclusions for the army from the message of Hubei and the rejection of the surrender, ordered another sweep of all headquarters, rear services and infirmaries in order to form additional composite units and strengthen the front. He also ordered new positions on the western section of the front, already outlined by Chief of Engineers Zeller. Parliamentarians of the enemy to meet with fire, Schmidt also added. Chief of Staff again prevailed, concluded Zell his story. He made me responsible for the construction of a new defensive line. Where I would get men for this purpose, of course, he did not tell me. Have you read the surrender leaflet yourself? No, I have not yet seen a copy, but I know the contents of the ultimatum. Take it out and read the whole thing. There's something in it. As soon as the colonel left, Cooper appeared with the leaflet in his hand. Now I had the text of the Soviet ultimatum. It began with a detailed analysis of the Sixth Army's situation. The analysis fully coincided with my own assessment. It went on to warn that severe frosts, cold winds and blizzards were coming. In view of our hopeless situation and the senselessness of further resistance, the Supreme High Command of the Red Army, in order to avoid wasted bloodshed, proposed to end the resistance of all German encircled troops and surrender in an organised manner. All personnel of the surrendered troops retain their military uniforms, insignia and orders, personal belongings, valuables and the highest officers, and cold weapons. All surrendered officers. Non-commissioned officers and soldiers will be immediately provided with normal food. All wounded, sick and frostbitten will be given medical aid. The message ended with the following words. Your answer is expected at 15 War Moscow time on January 9th, 1943 in writing through your personally appointed representative, who is to follow in a car with a white flag on the road Connie Passage, Kotlubin Station. Your representative will be met by Russian trusted commanders in the area B0.5 kilometres southeast of the road junction 564 at 15 hours 00 minutes on January 9th, 1943. If you reject our offer of surrender, we warn you that the troops of the Red Army and the Red Air Fleet will be forced to deal with the destruction of the encircled German troops, and for their destruction you will be responsible. The message was signed by representatives of the Red Army Supreme High Command Stavka, Colonel General of Artillery Voronov, and Commander of the Don Front, Lieutenant General Rokosovsky. I believed that the surrender proposal was fair, that those who survived and surrendered were not threatened with execution. On the other hand, at that time I could not yet not give in to Paulus's arguments. Now, in retrospect, I must say that the rejection of the proposed surrender was a decided matter even then, as soon as the commander of the Sixth Army requested the decisions of the General Command of Land Forces. Given the state of senselessly dying divisions and Hitler's shameless perfidy to the Sixth Army, 
Paulus was obliged in full accordance with the usual soldier's idea of loyalty for loyalty to finally decide to take independent action. I believe that in the case of a timely surrender could have been saved, and after the war returned to their families much more than 100,000 soldiers and officers. The argument, as if the bleeding and starving Sixth Army diverted large enemy forces from the southern wing of the German front, is unconvincing. The Soviet command undoubtedly also knew that the Sixth Army was forbidden to break through by orders from above and that its combat effectiveness had plummeted. This allowed him to draw conclusions as to the necessary degree of concentration of Soviet troops on the Volga. The rejection of the Soviet offer of surrender of January 8, 1943, is from the point of view of historical, military and human huge fault, not only of the supreme command of the Wehrmacht and the command of Army Group Don, but also of the command of the Sixth Army, the commanders of its army corps and divisions. The Soviet ultimatum became known to the troops in almost the entire area of operation of the army. This was confirmed to me by the head of the operations department, Colonel Elklep. The proposal is being discussed both in the headquarters and in the troops, think of pros and cons. However, even more excitement in the mines caused the news of the return of Hube and the new plans for liberation from the encirclement. The pendulum of mood over the past 14 days which had increasingly swung toward despair and apathy, is now once again swinging toward hope and vigour. Do these poor people, I asked Elhlep, have any idea what they will have to endure before their scheduled release date in mid-February? Do you really believe, Elhlep, that we will break out and that our troops will hold out for another six weeks? Yes, Adam, I believe it, my interlocutor answered without hesitation. I can assure you that Paulus will still unconditionally obey the Führer's orders. Schmidt and I will unconditionally support him in this regard. I don't understand one thing. Why does the Colonel General demand freedom of action? Because in the present phase it can only be understood as a cessation of hostilities, since further resistance has become futile. A breakthrough to the main front, distant by 400 kilometres, is completely eliminated for the remnants of our army. In this there is no disagreement between us. You say that surrender is ruled out, but what happens next? Our army is rapidly declining and soon there will be nothing left of it. Then let us die as disciplined soldiers. I repeat what I have told you before. I will never surrender to Russian captivity. Do you think all soldiers and officers think the same? I doubt it very much. How little willingness people have to risk their lives for more than dubious resistance is shown by their very negative attitude towards the fortress battalions. Now we're going to comb the rear again and form new battalions. But they have no value. Untrained formations melt like snow in the spring sun. You should be thinking more about how to satisfy the CO's requests for help, Adam. The 297th Infantry Division's section of the front is occupied by a completely insignificant force. There are no reserves to hold off the enemy. Every man we send to them counts. We can't lay down our arms now. I think Zell and Van Hooven have got you in over your heads. Surrender is out of the question. Everything in that message is communist propaganda. I don't believe a word of it. We have to fight to the last bullet. Finished Elhlep. Nothing could be done against such stubbornness. Business discussion was out of the question. In the afternoon of January 9th, Paulus addressed the troops with a proclamation. He rejected the offer of surrender as enemy propaganda aimed at undermining the morale of soldiers. Not a single person in the army, demanded the commander, should not believe the Soviet leaflets. It is necessary to firmly repel enemy attacks until the German tank formations will not start the offensive and will not come into contact with us. Not for the first time, the deceptive hope of breaking through the encirclement from the outside and the fear of capture again spurred the will to persistent resistance. Even the wounded took up arms again. Still, one event caused discontent in the troops, including the generals. 
General Hubei had no sooner returned to his duties, as the General Command of Land Forces ordered that he immediately flew out of the encirclement. He was charged with reorganizing the Sixth Army's supply outside the cauldron. This was quite paradoxical. The commander of a tank corps was assigned a task that could be better performed by a specialist intendant. For the same purpose, the Army Command, a few weeks ago, sent to the headquarters of the Army Group Oberquatermeister Colonel Bader. Was the summons to Hubei a consequence of his visit to Hitler's headquarters? Why did he fly away? About such questions asked me generals and officers, and they did not hide their indignation. I knew no more than what was said in the order for his flight. On the night of January 10th, General Hubei left. At my suggestion, the command of the Kornev Tank Corps was entrusted to Lieutenant General Schlemer, commander of the 3rd Motorized Division. There were some clear cases of officers who wanted to slip out of the cauldron. For example, the Chief of Operations of the headquarters of the 14th Panzer Division, Lieutenant Colonel Petzold, asked me to petition Schmidt for permission to fly away. What should I do here? he said. The division practically no longer exists. Its remnants are organised into combat groups. Division Commander Colonel Latman, by order of the Army Command, is forming combined units. I'm completely out of the picture. I suggested that Petzold personally report his request to Major General Schmidt, since he, as a staff officer, was subordinate directly to him. So he did. As might be expected, the Army Chief of Staff promptly sent him out the door. However, the Lieutenant Colonel did not yet consider the matter lost. He tried another ploy. The very next day he applied for a transfer to the troops, SS. At Schmidt's, however, he had no luck. The crumpled petition was thrown into a basket. Even more insolent than this Petzold, acted quartermaster of the Vihi Army Corps. He knew that he would not get permission to fly. Therefore, the quartermaster went directly to the nursery and pretended that he had to fly out of the cauldron on the orders of the army headquarters in order to clarify supply matters. So he was able to freely take a seat in the car, ready for takeoff. When Paulus found out about this clever trick of the quartermaster, through the command of Army Group Don, he brought him to the court martial as a deserter. As I learned later, this quartermaster was shot. Still, such cases of desertion among officers were not frequent. The officers took seriously the order to fight to the last bullet, shared hunger and deprivation, need and death with the soldiers. However, what they considered moral duty, loyalty to duty and discipline, due to the criminal concept of warfare, irresponsibility and deceitfulness of the highest state and military leadership, was long ago trampled and betrayed in the most cynical way. Superhuman sacrifice was the result of unwarranted trust in the leadership. We were captive to a militaristic ideology. This was the tragedy of many German soldiers and officers who died at Stalingrad. The top commanders of the Sixth Army were also guilty of this tragedy. Guilty.